Hi everybody, Sarah Cray here with Let's Make Art and I teach watercolor a new tutorial every week. And this week we are doing mountain top. Ooh, mountain. <laughs> I'm excited for this project and there are quite a few steps, but you guys can do this. You've done lots of steps before. So for this project, we have six steps. So our very first step after we trace it is we are going to paint in our little horizon color, horizon line here. Our second step is we will paint our mountain tops. Our third step is we will put in our sky. Our fourth step, we will paint our clouds. Our fifth step, we will do our trees. And the very last step is we will add our stars to our sky. Okay, we have Michael Cray. Hello. He's working the cameras. We're also married, hence the last name is the same. So, Keenan's still around. He's doing great. And I'm going to be using two paintbrushes for this project. I'm using a round six and a round two. These are my go-to brushes, so if you're gonna paint a lot of projects with this, I highly suggest you get in these brushes. However, you can use whatever you have. No stress. We are using four colors for this project, and the paint that I'm using is Dandelion Paint Co., which is our house brand liquid watercolors. And this first color is Tahoe Blue. Mm. Such a Rico. good one. <laughs> Second color, Burnt Orange. Third color is Black. And our last color is Bleed Proof White right here that came, that comes with this box. Now, um, there are other liquid watercolor brands. I highly recommend Dr. P.H. Martin. Um, there's a couple others I'm not as familiar with, but if you only have two paints, that's fine. Use what you got, no stress. Really, we're looking for like a neutral blue, uh, orange, kind of like a desaturated orange, a black, and a white. All right, we are going to trace our outline and then we will do our oath, then we'll get to painting. So I tape my outline down onto my watercolor paper and you wanna make sure your watercolor paper, you're painting on the more textured side. And then I'm gonna take my graphite paper and put dark shiny side down. And then any line that you make on the graphite paper will show up underneath. So I'm gonna start with my circle. <laughs> I first wanna say that even though I have an outline here for you guys, it is actually super hard to trace circles straight. You'll see this when I lift up my paper. It's gonna be a little bit wobbly and crooked, but that's okay. If you would rather like, if you have a like dish plate or a bowl or something that's similar in size to this, and then you can just like extend or make it smaller if you need to the insides of it, that might be easier or you can just follow this outline like I'm doing. Or a compass. Oh yeah, a compass would work great. I forgot that that was a thing. Okay, Okay, there's my circle. And now I'm gonna start tracing my mountains. Now you'll see that for the clouds, I did a lot of dashed lines because I, with my dashed lines that I have here, it's a reminder that there is a darker value in there or like a transition of values and not necessarily a hard edge. Um, so you're free to trace those or not. If you would rather not and then just keep your outline handy for reference as we're painting so you know where to put in those transitional values, you can or you can trace them on. It's up to you. I'm sorry I'm not chatty today. It's cold in the studio and I'm freezing today. <laughs> it is cold. Do we know the degrees today? The outside? Yeah. Oh, let me check for you. Okay. It is uh, real temperatures five. Feels like negative 13. <laughs> Doesn't Hamilton sound great to you guys? <laughs> tropical paradise. <laughs> and just our... So we're in the back of the store. I know that we have shared some behind the scenes. If you, if you follow us on like Instagram, um, sometimes we'll share some behind the scenes of what the studio is set up like. And unfortunately, the heater doesn't always um, make it back here. So It's like a concrete room. So mm -hmm. it's just like, I feel like it's freezing me actively from every direction. Yeah. 
We actually used to have a little space heater that we would keep for days like this because sometimes my hands get so cold that it makes it hard to paint. <laughs> Okay, and I'm just doing the trees. And for the clouds, I'm gonna follow. And what I want you to remember with outlines is this is not, I don't want you to view this as a coloring page. This is a suggestion of where things can go. But please use this as a guide, not as the rule. Is this a mythical place or do you think this is based on somewhere, do you know? I, um, don't think it's based on anything. Okay. This started, and if you guys follow me on um, Instagram, I kind of shared my process of that, where I started with one project that was actually a more like pulled out project, and there was water underneath here and this whole like mountain scene, and I realized like mm, that's going to be too difficult to teach, so I like zoomed it in, and that's how I got here. So I kind of made up these mountains, but that doesn't mean that there's not like a mountain somewhere that looks like it. The Flora, fauna, and rocks reminds me of the Sierra Nevadas, kind of like Wright's Lake area. Mm, okay. So I'm going to assume it's that. Assume away, my friend. Thank you. Okay. We got our outline. We're going to do our oath, and then we'll paint. Sweet. If you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. Thank you so much. And um, I love starting with an oath. And actually how the oath started was I was taking a lettering class and the teacher made us promise beforehand that we wouldn't compare our work. And that made such a huge difference on my experience that I just thought like, what an excellent way to get in the mindset, mindset of being creative. And then I thought, what is important for us to remember when we're starting something new besides not comparing. And I thought being kind to ourselves because that is that is something we struggle with when we're trying something new. We kind of expect ourselves to be amazing at it first try and when we're not, we like beat ourselves up, which is just not fair. And then to have fun because I really believe that when you're having fun and that passion is coming out, then it's all about learning and it's all about the journey and the experience and the joy. And that's what I hope you guys get from this. I think all the time, imagine all of the like great painters who just gave up too early yeah you know the potentials in there somewhere but they were like oh i'm not good at this yeah i mean everybody picks up a paintbrush for the first time one day no matter wh where they end up everybody's a beginner some point okay let's get started so i'm going to start by just painting in my horizon line so i'm going to take my burnt orange pull it to the middle of my palette grab a little bit of water to lighten the value and I actually really love this color because it really reminds me of when that the like sun is rising, that kind of gold pink color a little bit, even though this is like an orange. I don't know. You'll see it. It's a pretty color. Okay, so I'm just going to take this lightened value orange, use my round six, and go along the mountains here. And then I'm going to take water and blend up. I want the most color to be where it's hitting the mountains. And then it kind of fades into nothing towards our clouds, okay? I know you've said multiple times that brown is just dark orange, mm -hmm. which is awesome. I actually fell down a YouTube rabbit hole of this guy explaining about how with like the color wheel on Photoshop, he went through and showed that like to get browns, you do go to orange and then just go towards black. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's funny that we've like named dark orange brown mm -hmm. because when you go around the rest of the circle, you it's just dark green and dark blue. Like, yes. and then you get to dark orange and you're like, oh, brown. Yeah, yeah. You just named it something else. And it's funny because we name it something else, we disassociate it from each other. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was like color mixing a lot and painting a lot where I realized I'm like, Oh my gosh. I'm like, brown is just dark orange. <laughs> like, and I had this like moment of being like, whoa. I'm like, that, why do we make it harder on ourselves? Like that, that one is kind of funny, but. He goes in depth about the difference between additive color 
and subtractive color. So like color that you make with light and color that's like from a tree. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. That sounds amazing. YouTube is the best. Also the worst. <laughs> you learn so much stuff if you want to. So much information is out there. Okay, now one thing that I want to point out with this horizon, you can see that my darkest value where most color is right along like the edge and then it lightens up. Now I do want to point out and if whenever you're doing whenever you're doing mountain ranges or anything against the sky, for the most part you have to remember in your head that these two elements are independent of each other. And what I mean by that is sometimes if we were to do like a full color transition, we're not really in this one, but if I were to do like yellow, red, blue or whatever, I would my brain would tell me to follow the silhouette of this mountain exactly and then do the color transitions from there. So if I'm starting from yellow and then to blue and red, I would do yellow, blue, red across the entire thing. However, that's not true to what we would see in nature because the mountain is just in front of the sky. So the yellow would be down here and then it would go to blue and then it would go to red. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Totally. So you can see here that I have a darker value down here and then up here, it is not as dark because that sky and color is independent from the top of this mountain. Like pretend that you painted it without the mountain there and then yeah. slap the mountain on top. Yes, that's what you have to keep in mind, but it's really tricky thinking that way, so I just wanna point it out. This one, it's not a huge deal because this is such a light um, value color, and this is kind of a fantastical scene anyway. Like, I don't, I don't know if we would actually really see that all in one thing in nature. Um, so it gives us a little bit of freedom to play. But when you're trying to do realistic scenes like that, keep that in mind, is those elements are independent from each other. And so you have to do your color transitions as such. Okay, now we're going to move on to step two, which is our mountains. So this is where I'm going to mix my burnt orange with black to get some brown. And I'm gonna do a couple different variations. So I'm gonna do an even mix to get a brown. I'm gonna do another mix to get a super dark brown. So now I have three different browns to work from. And I'm actually just ended up mixing those two together. And now I have, I have, I'm have this burnt orange, I have a light brown, I have a medium brown, and I have a dark brown. And this, my friend, is exactly why I love the butcher tray palette because I have all of this room to just pull color and mix. That's why I like it. And they clean up nicely. <laughs> they actually really do. Okay, so I have this medium brown. And I'm gonna go onto the mountains where I kind of have these like little sections that I outlined here. And I'm gonna put them in. And I'm starting with my dark values first. Okay. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of water, grab some light brown, and kind of like start to smear a little bit this brown that I mix. Now I did one smear and I noticed that that brown is super neutral and I love how in my original, it really was reading more like that rocky orange color, you know what I'm saying? So I'm gonna grab a little bit more burnt orange and kind of play, oh, there we go. That's the color that I'm looking for. Kind of spread it out. And I'm using like the dry brush technique where there's not a lot of water on my brush, so then when it smears, I have this rough texture here, like so, okay? And then I'm gonna mix a little bit of my blue with my brown, just to get a different kind of tan in there. I want it to read more like a sand color. So I'm mixing some blue in there. I'm gonna go along the bottom here. And it's color in my mountains. I've been married to you through this journey because I feel like I've watched your tool bag your painting tool bag grows so much. Yes. Like, yes. Just watching you talk about the dry brush technique is so fun for me. <laughs> oh yeah, and what what's fun about that, and I think that's why I kind of stress about not comparing, and it's a reminder to myself because I am, I am learning and improving every time I paint the same as you guys are. And if you go back to our very first tutorials of 
what I was teaching and the projects that I'm teaching now, I have improved in my skill just because like I'm painting every single week at least with you guys, which is amazing. And I love that we're on this journey together and I can share these new tips and tools and techniques with you as I learn them as well. And I think that's the great thing about like trying anything is there's always so much to learn. And I could be doing this for five more years or 20 more years or 50 more years and I will continually be learning because there's so much, you know? And my styles are always changing. Anyways, it's fun. There's a, a chart, I don't know if you've heard of it, called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of it? No. It's this little like graph and it shows how like when you don't really know something, you feel like you do, so you peek up. And then the more you learn about it, the more you realize that you know nothing yes. about it. Yes. And then like the, the last part of the graph is the journey towards actually learning and getting good at it. Yeah. I love that. Me too. And there were some moments where, um, and, I'm, and I appreciate this, where I'll be teaching and someone will ask me a question and I'd be like, I don't know. Well, let me think about it. Let me find that out for you or, okay. So I'm gonna go back in with some burnt orange and really start to like brighten up some of this color because right now we're working with neutrals and I want some pops of color. So I'm just gonna go straight in with my burnt orange. Just kind of following the reference here, what I'm trying to show is that there are like rocks or formations that are sticking out of the mountain and that is creating textures and shadows. And then the parts that are we are leaving white are highlights like maybe where the sun is directly hitting those moments or maybe there's a little bit of snow we're just trying to show that things are popping out and so to do that we have to have a highlight and then we have to have a shadow underneath it and that will create um that would give us the hint of form but it doesn't have to be because this is kind of as we discussed earlier like not necessarily a i wasn't thinking of a specific mountain. So I'm kind of just basing this off in my head. So I'm kind of just like, oh yeah, sure. There's a rock formation that kind of pokes out here and this is a highlight. Is that geologist Sarah? That's geologist Sarah. <laughs> There's a mountain over here. <laughs> And if you blend too much that you lose some of your dark values, we'll let it dry and go back and put them in. That's the beauty of watercolor. You can always let it dry and put them back in later. And then this little guy's back here, don't forget him. This is like the, the edge of a separate one that I'm kind of putting in here. Not super detailed. Yeah. And then you can even go in if you want a little bit more detail. You can go in with your round too. I'm gonna grab a little bit of black and mix like a super, super dark, super, super dark, almost black, brown. And kind of just do littler marks in here. The Alps are so heavy that uh, they push Europe into the ocean every year. It sinks. I don't remember exactly how much, but... Really? Yeah, the Alps are super heavy. Well, that's scary. And cool. All right. There's our mountains. That feels good. All right, we're going to move on to step three. We're going to do our sky. So, now I want to point out that step three and step four are kind of... Um, similar to each other, so they're gonna kind of seamlessly run together. I think you bumped your mic, but you're okay. I'm okay? All right, sorry for bumping. All right, so for my sky, I want the very top of my circle to be a really dark blue, so I'm gonna mix Tahoe blue and black together, and then as I make my way down to my clouds, I'm going to add more water and more blue 
to go from dark blue to just blue, okay? So I got Tahoe blue here. A little bit of black to mix that nice navy color. It's such a gorgeous color. And I'm gonna go along the top here using my round six. Okay, add water, kind of start to blend that out. And then now is where I'm gonna start adding more blue. Okay, so now I'm kind of just grabbing Tahoe blue, bringing that down. You will get hard lines and blooms in your sky. Embrace that. And then if you gotta go back in and darken some of those areas or you feel like you can do another layer somewhere, do it. Let me turn my paper here. Okay, so I'm kind of like overlapping my clouds a little bit with the blue and I'm doing that on purpose because what I'm going to do to start giving shape of my clouds is when it's wet like this, I'm going to grab my paper towel and I'm actually going to lift the color around the top unevenly with my paper towel. Okay, and that's the start of our clouds right there. Because if you look at clouds, how they communicate form is there are parts that are um, highlighted and white. And then if you look, there's actually so many like layers in there in order to, to communicate such a three-dimensional fluffy form, there has to be different values. It's not just white. And so this is the start of us showing that there are different values at play, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna grab a little bit, bit of this dark blue that I mixed and I'm gonna add a little bit of water to it, maybe a little bit of black to kind of like neutralize it. I don't want straight gray, but I want more of a gray blue, okay? And I add water to that for the light value and now I'm gonna start putting in my, my cloud form a little bit. So here is, you can see where it's kind of starting here And I'm just going to follow the outline and let me have the outline next so you guys can look at that also. Can they see that, Michael? Um, kind I mean, of. Kind of. If you want to see the whole thing, you'd have to cover up your painting a bit. Okay, I'll, here I'll just show you. See this chunk that I'm putting in here? Perfect. And this chunk that I'm putting in here, that's what I'm going to put in. And I'm just going to kind of look at the reference. Okay, so now you can see my cloud starting to take form. I'm kind of painting around it to create the form. And then how you communicate depth in a sky is the clouds at the top are going to be bigger. And then the clouds as they go through space, as they go deeper into this three-dimensional world, is they get smaller. So these ones here, they're at the top, they're closest to us. And then if we wanna communicate that the sky keeps going, then our clouds are actually gonna get smaller. And that's why we have little detailed clouds here to show that it's going in, okay? There's more, there's layers. Does that make sense? Yep. And in, in painter land, mm -hmm. when you're composing a new painting, do you like think of things like the rule of thirds? Mm -hmm. Yep. That's all about composition. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just didn't know if that was like, I don't know, 
native to photography or if like so um that that is a principle within photography but it's true for also art and if you guys aren't familiar with rule of thirds what it is is if you have your composition you are going to create a grid where you're going to put in three sections this way one two three and then three sections this way one or is it two sections it's two lines to divide it into three sections. thank you so it's two lines two lines and then the points of interest that you want to hit is you want them to line up where those lines intersect across horizontally and vertically that's where you like visually want to have maybe more the the interesting parts hit is that did i explain that well yeah i think so okay and I, I think if you can't hit those points, the second best thing is to have them like on the line. Yeah. I was looking close. at your skyline and your horizon line, and like those are on thirds points. Mm -hmm. So that's what it made me think. Of and it. that's why because and I talk about this a lot when we do like loose floral paintings because that's a great lesson in composition. But I never, most of the time, I very rarely start with something in the right middle of my paper. No matter what it is that I'm painting, landscape, uh, people, whatever. To have the main thing go right in the center is going to be super difficult to make it feel even. So even when you're doing landscapes, you never, you usually never want your horizon line to be straight in the center. It's either in the top third or the lower third. It's never right in the middle because um, that just cuts it right in half. Now, I do want to point out that the fun thing about art is you know these rules so you can break them. So. I, I don't want you to look at that and then see a painting that's like there's a line straight through the middle in a landscape and you're like, oh, well, they must know, know that rule. I mean, that was just a design choice that that artist decided to make and it's not wrong. But if you are feeling frustrated because your composition just feels off and you're not entirely sure what's going on, why, and this landscape isn't really feeling and like it feels chunky, it could just be that there's a strong middle line right through the center of it. So it's good to know those rules so then you can manipulate them to whatever you want. I also found, I mean, again, I'm coming at this from a photography point, but there are so many compositional rules that sometimes you can cripple yourself by thinking about all of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's like the rule of thirds and then there's like the seven squiggle, like there's all of these things. And if you spend all of your time thinking about how can I make this fit the rules, then the art itself suffers. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm going to actually go in. So you, you guys can see where the, that like, where I lifted up that color, right? To the top of the clouds. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I need to separate that space more because that value is very similar. So I'm actually going to go in and just kind of like separate it by making a darker value and then blending it out. And I make that in itself already, don't the clouds poke out more? Totally. That's why I'm doing it. You'll notice I'm chatty and it's not because I'm warm, it's because I think I now have hypothermia. <laughs> <laughs> Michael is. <laughs> I'm so cold. <sighs> it's gonna be okay. Okay, and that I feel like just really made my clouds pop out. Isn't that fun? You might not need that for yours. Yours could have been a different enough value that it wasn't necessary. Um, your painting will inform you of what you should do. So if you see me doing something, but you look at yours and you're like, oh, I don't know if I actually really need that. Well then, don't do it. And then if you want to put in just a little bit, I, I have some darker values in here where I have, here's my medium values, and then here's an example of like a dark value, dark value, dark value. So I'm just gonna go in and kind of like put in some of those dark values here. Just, just to try and add a little bit more dimension. We should, uh, as a Let's Make Art conglomerate, get people to buy a frame. Yeah. And then every month we'll all decide together which one of the projects that will hang up for the month. And then that way, if you're out and about going to a friend's house and you see like, oh, they're a llama too. That would be cool. Yeah. It's like a secret code. A secret club, <laughs> like a secret club. <laughs> that would be yeah. so cool. Oh, I love that idea. Okay. Ooh, I feel good about that. All right, I'm gonna let that dry. 
And again, I want to point out, I am going to get blooms and hard lines in my sky. That is okay. This is still going to communicate as sky. I'm going to really embrace those watercolor textures and it's not going to be a big deal. I'm going to move on to step five here. We're going to do our trees. So I'm going to switch to my round two. I'm going to grab black and then I'm going to add some water to it to make it a lighter value because even within these trees, I want to communicate layers of trees. So I have some trees in the background here that are super light in value, like a gray. And then the ones in the foreground here are pure black. So I'm going to do the gray ones first. So the one, the trees that are kind of poking out more, I want you to do those in gray. Now I pretty much just outlined the trunk here. I, I didn't like take time to like do the outline of all of the different foliage like shape around the tree. So um, that you guys are going to freehand. And I have done, um, we've done tree silhouettes on quite a few tutorials, but so hopefully this isn't a brand new um, introduction to how to do trees. But basically how I do trees is and I'll do it. Is this, do you want me to move it up for a close up, Michael? No, it's good. It's good? Okay. So I put my trunk in. And then what you want to do is you got to remember that trees start pointy at the top and then get wider on their way down. It's like a triangle shape. Okay. And so my marks near the top of my trunk, where I'm doing kind of like these branches that stick out, are going to be small. And then as I work my way down, then I'm going to go out bigger and bigger with my kind of dashes. And I'm going to let them overlap too. It's not just a straight line. Like so. And I'll do it again with the darker value. I mean, these are just our little hints of trees here. So you might be, not be able to see it as clearly, but I'll go back in with the darker ones and hopefully that will help you guys to see a little bit better what I'm doing. While you're doing trees, I got a plant fact for you. All right. So when you think about like a tree, it's heavy, right? And you mm -hmm. think like, where does all of the material that the tree is made out of, where does it come from? And people think like, well, the dirt, obviously, it like eats the dirt and makes itself, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of botanists that have done experiments where they will measure the weight of soil, plant a seed, have it grow to full, and then weigh the soil again and Plants actually pull very minimal amounts of stuff out of the soil. A plant is made out of the air. The carbon dioxide that it eats, it pulls the carbon off, and that is the structure of its entire body. What? Plants are made out of carbon dioxide. The, like, the, the structure of them is mostly the carbon from carbon dioxide. That is amazing. It gets trace minerals like magnesium and like all these things from the dirt, but it's such tiny amounts. The entirety of the plant is mostly made from air. That is, that blows my mind. That is crazy. so crazy. And is it all, is it all trees that like, they, like the ones that are close to each other that are the same kind, if they're, they like share resources within each other. So if one is feeling like sick, then the other ones will like share its nutrients with it. Is that a thing? Am I that is a thing. Do you okay. want to know what's the craziest part about that? Yeah. It's not the trees that do that to each other. It's a third party. It's a fungus <laughs> that lives underground and it makes these mycelium networks and it knows it can allocate resources from tree to tree because it benefits from a healthy forest it's like a forest what? manager what babe wow and then trees you just said like, babe pick up on this and they can signal what did i say sorry you, said, you called me babe oh sorry <laughs> it's okay <laughs> i'm excited um these trees kind of know that this exists now and so they can send a chemical signal to this fungus saying like there's a stressor coming my way. The trees around me are dying. I'm going to die next. Please take my nutrients and allocate them to the rest of the trees. Wow. Yeah. It's nuts. <laughs> that is so amazing. <laughs> I love that you got so excited there. You can tell how our 
this is how we talk at home because like <laughs> I come home Michael's like yesterday it was actually about dishwashers and so I came home and Michael's like I learned how dishwashers work y'all are like, using your dishwashers wrong <laughs> so anyways I I'm glad that you guys are able to experience Michael <laughs> like I am with just his like passion for for knowledge and learning. It's so confusing. I have a headphone in my ear, everybody, and I hear this sound on like an eight second delay. So I get confused sometimes. So when you said, when you like looked embarrassed, I was afraid that I cussed. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I was going. I was you just really moment. care about trees and this fungus. <laughs> Different trees attract different fungus. We did a study on oaks in Sacramento in college where we went. And uh, there was like three main varieties of fungus that did this. It's, it's so interesting. And we know so little about it too. Yeah. And it gets crazy when you think about the logistics because these fungus have developed like essentially perfect little keys to go into the perfect lock holes so that they can like go in and get the nutrient. It's all so crazy so efficient right I, is it efficient i feel like it is like that's amazing yeah i don't know yeah 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 efficient maybe efficient is the wrong word what word am i thinking of heck of cool <laughs> <laughs> that's it okay so when you're doing these trees i now moved on to doing i did the ones in gray in the back and now i'm going to do the ones in black in the front and you guys are the keeper of your paintings and so if you're noticing that Maybe some sections are looking bare or there should be a tree there with, that's not in the outline. You go ahead and you add that tree, my friend. Just remember you want it narrow on the top and then as you work your way down, it gets wider. And I'm doing, I'm doing dots and I'm doing dashes. Usually the marks on the top are gonna be smaller and thinner because I'm trying to communicate newer branches or needles or things like that so they are just going to be smaller because they're new and then on their way down they get bigger it's the same with like thinking of like the trunk of a tree you can tell how old a tree is by how big it is right so it's, it's that same kind of thought the shape of them if this is in fact a picture of the sierra nevadas the oldest organisms on earth live there Oh, really? Yeah, they're called bristlecone pines. How old are they? Like 4K plus. Whoa. I don't know, but they're really old. Don't you remember listening to that story about the guy who accidentally cut one down? Yes. You guys should listen to a podcast called Radio Lab. The episode is called Oops. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm feeling pretty good about my trees. I'm just going to like step back and be like, uh, where do I feel like there could be a little bit more? Um, so I'm seeing, I've, I just want one a little bit taller right up here. Now the funny thing about putting in trees is like when you draw your trunk line, you wanna try and make it straight. Sometimes mine are crooked, which is, which is true to nature, right? Trees are not perfectly straight all the time, but just compositionally, I'm always just like, try <laughs> I like turn my head <laughs> um, so if it happens to you don't stress but I try and make my trunk straight just because if I don't it does throw off the the viewer a little bit but there are crooked trees you know I love going camping and seeing the trees that have like blown over or something when they were young mm -hmm. and then just like go with it yeah Throw sideways for a bit and yes then straight up Trees are awesome. Trees really are awesome. Okay. All right. Woohoo. Done. I feel good about that. All right. We're on to our very last step. We're going to be putting in our stars in our sky. So I'm going to cover my painting here. Is this uh, something you learned to do because of accidents or? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm going to remove any expensive equipment that is near me. I'm not going to be wearing my favorite outfit. Um, I will not have my husband's very expensive camera right next to me. 
And I'm gonna use my round six, I'm gonna get it wet, I'm gonna grab some bleed proof white. I'm gonna dip it in the water one more time so that, so that white wants to come off, it's kinda loose. And then I'm going to fleck. You can use a toothbrush for this. I use a paintbrush just in this way. Does the toothbrush work better? Um, I will admit that I honestly have never tried it. Oh. I've never tried a toothbrush. But from videos that I have seen of other artists, yeah, toothbrush works great. Just like holds a lot or something? Yeah, so you, you, what you do is you get the toothbrush, you dip it in the white, and you take your thumb and go across all the bristles, and so it flicks off. But you get so many different um, variations and sizes and a lot that it's pretty cool. Where this one, it's kind of more like here and there. And you really have to work this way to get. Every time you do that, I want to go bleh, 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 bleh. <laughs> That's a good noise for it. Okay, so there's that. And then I like to go in with a round two. Sorry, don't leave your paintbrushes in your water cup. <laughs> do as I, I just, say, not as I do. I was about to do that and I'm like, no, Sarah, we don't do that. Okay, my round two. Pick up some white and do some bigger ones. And I want to do like a shooting star here. I, I just think it's a fun little element. You don't have to, but I do. how I do that is I just do little dots and then whatever one I want to like feel like it's shooting off is I just make a little tail. Boop, boop. Excuse my silence again, I'm Googling frostbite. <laughs> well, this baby is done. I love that sky so much. Isn't it fun? I kind of actually like how this bloom looks like an, a, another cloud, but yeah. like far away or really thin. You know what I mean? It's like another layer. Kind of reminds me of Lion King. When the dad comes back in cloud form, this is the start of that. <laughs> Simba. Simba. Okay. <laughs> wow. You guys, I had a great time painting with you. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. If you're on Instagram, I would like to see what you're making. You can tag us at Let's Go Make Art or hashtag Let's Make Art. If you are on uh, Facebook, you can join our watercolor group. It's for the sole purpose of you guys sharing your work. That's called Let's Make Art watercolor. Oh, I just realized something. I got a little white mountain here that I didn't paint. Do you see that? I thought it was snow. It could be snow, but it's sticking out too white for me and it's bothering me. So, boop. Problem solved. <laughs> sorry, I didn't want to leave you guys hanging there if you were like, what about this one mountain? So sorry about that. Um, that watercolor group is called Let's Make Our Watercolor. And if you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. Michael, Thank you for being here. You're welcome. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.